and all of God's children said, Amen. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Willow Creek Presbyterian Church. I'm Lauren and I'm so glad that you're joining us for worship this morning. This is our fifth Sunday in Lent. Um, I do have a few announcements to bring to your attention today. We will um, continue our practice of celebrating communion by intinction throughout Lent. Later in the service, you'll be invited to come forward and take bread from the common loaf and dip it in the common cup, or take an individually pre-cut piece of gluten-free bread from the tray in an individual cup. And if you're worshiping with us online, you can find anything to represent the bread and the cup so you can celebrate with us. Um, this Wednesday will be our final uh, Lenten soup study. Um, so I hope you can join us for that. If you haven't been able to come all Lent, you can still come this Wednesday. Each discussion and study is standalone. Um, if you are already planning on coming, I haven't checked the sign-up sheet, but it might be possible, available, to sign up to bring soup. So if that's interesting to you, sign up downstairs in the fellowship hall. We meet at 5.30, and we're usually done around 7. We share a simple meal together, and we will continue studying the scripture that's read this morning and continue in our series of more than 12, looking at folks in the Gospels that Jesus interacted with other than the 12 disciples. Um, this Saturday is the paint party, correct? Okay. Can you give details on that? Sorry. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Thank you. So there's some flyers up downstairs. Um, if you need any help with the registration, just see um, myself or Marin or probably Annie would be happy to help with that. <laughs> Put a few people on this spot. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. It starts at 9 this Saturday in the Fellowship Hall. Um, and it's, I'm going to get the name of the organization wrong, but Winnebago. Oh, see, I was so wrong. <laughs> okay, Winnebago and Boone County. Okay, Farm Bureau. Thank you. Um, so that'll be a lot of fun. It's open to anybody, um, so invite other folks and come Saturday and paint. Um, if you notice on the back of your bulletin, there is our Holy Week schedule. Unbelievably, it's coming. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. You won't want to miss that. We'll have our Palm Processional, um, and Pastor Tanya will be preaching. Looking forward to that. Um, and then a little later in the week, we'll have our Monday, Thursday potluck and communion service on Thursday, March 28th. That's downstairs in the fellowship hall, starting at six o'clock with potluck, and then we'll have a short, simple worship service um, when we're done with our meal. Um, and then, of course, Easter is March 31st. We'll have our sunrise service at 8 a.m., which is a good time for a sunrise service, over at the chapel um, at Argyle Scottish Cemetery. We'll come back here for breakfast and an Easter egg hunt, and then worship up here at 10 a.m. So I hope you can join us for all of those. Are there other announcements or prayer requests this morning, Beth? Okay. And what was her name? Sorry. Mar okay. Marky. Okay, so um, praise that Emily was um, in a play this past weekend. Um, is it still going on? Or is it, okay, so unfortunately, if you didn't see it, you've missed it, but um, two um, performances went really, really well. So prayers of joy for that. Um, and then also Beth's friend Jen is a year cancer-free, um, and that's fantastic. And then prayers for her Aunt Margie. Um, your dad's sister. Yes, okay. Their dad's sister. She's not doing well. So prayers for Margie and her husband and all who, who love and care for her. Thank you. Are there, yes. I don't even know how that works, but Piper's basketball team. Oh, that's how it works. Okay. <laughs> so Piper's basketball team, third place in the fifth grade tournament and first place in the sixth grade tournament, which is quite an accomplishment. So congratulations to Piper. 
Fantastic. Good work. <laughs> That's wonderful. Others, yes. All right, that's prayers for Dale's sister, Judy, who's having surgery on April, on April 1st or just at the beginning? Okay, on April 1st. Okay, thank you. Prayers for Judy. Others. Yes, Mirren. Yeah, that's prayers for... Um, um, Marin's significant other, Doug's mother, passed away very unexpectedly Monday morning, and so services are tomorrow, so prayers for um, Doug and his family and all who are gathering to celebrate and honor her life. Beth? Connor? Oh! Tuesday? Was it this past... Okay, so Connor's birthday. Connor, how old are you turning? Four? Connor's turning four. So we'll have to sing in a second. I'm, I think that he's not the only birthday in our midst. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, John's birthday will be Tuesday. He's a little older than four, a little bit. Yes. <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> you just had to say that part. <laughs> I saw some flurries this morning. <laughs> um, so a praise for, uh, you said 40? Am I 40, 40 year anniversary? Um, that's wonderful. <laughs> Hopefully we won't go out in a blizzard today. Are there other birthdays for us to sing for? All right, let's sing for Connor and John. Wonderful. So lots of prayers and lots of praises in our midst this morning. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Holy God, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for the things you have laid, us, laid on our hearts, our joys, as well as our concerns. May we experience your presence here. May we become more like you here. Remind us that you carry all that worries us just as you carry us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit and join me in our call to worship. Jonah cried out to the people of Nineveh, Repent, for in forty days you will perish. Lead us, O Lord, from death to life, eternal God, as we are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. So give us the grace of repentance, that we may pass through the grave for Christ and be born again to eternal life. For Christ is the one who lived, was crucified, dead, and buried, and rose again for us. Amen. Come, let us worship God. Let's remain standing and sing together hymn number 418, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling.
You may be seated. Though we have sinned, God has mercy and pardon for you and for me. Knowing this, we can freely confess our sins. Will you pray with me the prayer of confession found in your bulletins? Holy and merciful God, we confess we have not been as generous as we should. We confess that we give with control, never quite sacrificing our comfort. We confess that we give within reason, never quite challenging our faith in your provision. Will you help us find wisdom in our relationship with our possessions? Will you free us from the ways of this world and forgive us for our lack of trust in you? Here are our silent prayers of confession. Amen. God's love has been poured into your hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We share the peace of Christ with one another, saying, May the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Will you join your hearts with me in prayer? Holy God, Thank you for giving us your word. May we open our hearts to your truth. May your truth make us more like you. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning begins on page 1570. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 13 through 23. Listen for God's word. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked him, rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad, because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? This is the word of the Lord.
all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. And I'd like to invite the children to join me down front for a children's moment. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to see if y'all can help demonstrate something this morning, but only if you want to. Brandon, I think you would do a really good job at this. And maybe, maybe Connor and Finley will join you. We'll see. Piper, I have a special job for you. Don't worry. You're going to like it. I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> um, Brandon, do you think, not right now, but when I finish talking, you could go back to the doors and then run down the aisle and jump up on the steps? Do you, do you think you could do that, Connor? Yeah? Finley, do you want to do it? Or do you just want to watch the boys? I don't blame you. Okay, but, but Brandon and Connor, y'all can do that? Yeah, okay. Now that we know you're such a fantastic basketball player, this is the one thing I need. <laughs> Will you block? <laughs> Will you just stand right here by the communion table and make sure they don't hit the communion table? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so Piper, you can get in position. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Okay, Brandon and Connor, go to the doors. Go to the doors. Go, Connor, go with him. Yeah. You want to go? <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll let him go first, and then if you want to have a chance, you can. But Finley and Connor, I suggest you scoot. Scoot that way. Scoot. 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 Yeah. Okay, you're taking a chance. All right, Brandon, show us how fast you can run down this aisle. Brandon, go. Oh, yes, yeah, so good. Yeah, your turn. Go for it. Go. You want to go? Go to the doors. Oh, yeah. Perfect. It's a thing. We start on the seat. We run there. We run back. Excellent job. Hey, give me a high five. That was great. You also did great. Oh, high five. High five. You're like, dang it. There we go. All right, Connor, go. Run. So fast. Ooh, I like the leap and jump. Excellent. And with the light up shoes. Okay, great. Guys, you did such a good job. Um, yep, thank you. Perfect. Yes. Um, so there were two things that happened in the scripture Lucas just read. There was a story about children coming to Jesus, and then there was a story about a grown man coming to Jesus. Who do you think, the children or the grown man? Who came to Jesus the way Brandon and Connor just showed us, running and jumping? Was that the way the children came to Jesus or the way the man came to Jesus? Any ideas? Jesus. Jesus is a good answer. Yes. Finley, who do you think? Was that the way the kids came to Jesus or the way the man came to Jesus? Yeah. Well, it's a bit of a trick question. That's the way the man came to Jesus. The story says that the children were carried to Jesus, which might mean they were a little younger than y'all, but it also definitely means they had some people helping them out, looking out for them, just like y'all have people who help you out and look out for you. The adults you live with, your teachers and friends, people who carry you to church, even if sometimes you're grumbly about it, but people who would carry you to Jesus if they could. Um, and so, also, we have this grown man who ran just like Brandon and Connor showed us. How would that have looked, do you think? What if, what if Mr. Lucas was the one who ran and jumped the way you just did? <laughs> if only he weren't wearing a kilt. Maybe next time. <laughs> like, um, um, that would have looked pretty silly, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, and so that's something else for us to notice, too, in today's story, that sometimes when we're coming to Jesus, it's okay to look silly. Other people might not understand what we're doing, but that is okay. All right, let's say a quick prayer. God of rain and sunshine, thank you for all that you have given us. Teach us to run to you, and teach us also how to carry each other and how to be carried to you. Teach us how to believe the grace you have for us and share it with others. Amen. All right, thanks, y'all. Our second reading this morning picks up where Lucas left off. 
Mark chapter 10, verses 24 through 31. Listen again for God's word. The disciples were amazed at the words of Jesus. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me, and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of our risen Savior. Praise to you, O Christ. One of the unique things that I love about our wonderful church is our diverse age distribution. There are plenty of folks with wisdom in the room. You can tell by the grayness of their hair or the lack of their hair. But gray or bald is not all that we have. There are folks of all ages who gather here every Sunday, and we are better for it. And indeed, all ages carry some wisdom. I know I'm not the only one who learns the most from the youngest among us. We are incredibly blessed by the children of this congregation, the ones who come forward bravely for the children's moment and always teach us something about God and God's word. And even for the ones who are a little too young for that, when they cry out and babble, reminding us how comfortable they are here. Not every church with gray-haired folks in the pews have has their worship punctuated by babies' cries, by the holy reminder that the future of the church is present among us. May our little ones always feel that their presence is not just tolerated, but encouraged and welcome. May they always feel unhindered in this holy place. It's difficult, really, for us to imagine the gospel scene. Why would anyone hinder the little children as they are coming to Jesus. The disciples don't know what they're supposed to do, but they are anxious and unsure in the presence of so many children. They assume Jesus needs to be protected from the mass of giggling, playful unpredictability. Of all the strange things the disciples have witnessed while following Jesus, they find this moment most perplexing. No holy teacher would allow this risk of sickness and ritual uncleanliness. I wonder if they cast lots to decide who must take on the role of substitute teacher and attempt to command the children's attention and redirect them so that they could get back to doing their disciplely things. But the disciples' rebuke is quickly interrupted by holy indignation as Jesus shocks them once again. Do not hinder them. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these, he says. The kingdom of God belongs to the ones who are shouting loudly, laughing unselfconsciously, reaching unreservedly, holding Jesus, holding holiness uninhibitedly. The disciples grumble to one another, we have been following this dude getting covered in the dust of his sandals. We are filthy out here trying to keep him clean, witnessing inexplicable healings and unexplainable miracles, being called all kinds of names, putting our lives in danger, rejected by family and friends. We are putting in the work. What have these children done to earn the kingdom of God? This question burns as they wait 
and watch as Jesus blesses every blessed child until finally, perhaps it's nap time or something, all of the children are carted away. But before they can proceed, before they can take even one more step on their disciples' journey, a man runs up and falls to his knees before Jesus. This, at least, is a familiar scene. The disciples know better than to hinder this guy. He's respectable, clean. He walks the walk and talks the talk. Someone like Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, who also fell at Jesus' feet, begging for his daughter's healing. Someone like you and me, a chairperson of a committee, an elder, a deacon, an usher, a musician, someone who holds the bread or cup, someone whose belonging is not questioned by anyone except maybe themselves. The man kneeling on the ground in front of Jesus asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The man had watched among the crowd, amazed that the teacher and healer humbled himself, getting in the dirt with the children, lowering to their level, seeing things from their perspective, letting them crawl all over him. He overheard Jesus' indignant proclamation, do not hinder them, the kingdom of God belongs to them. And he ached for that belonging. The man heard Jesus bless each child and watched Jesus rise from the ground and not even bother to brush the dirt off. He can't stop himself from running toward the blessing the children had received. He wonders how to ask, what to say to frame his hope, his fear, and it gets all mixed up in his busy soul. What must I do to earn eternal life? Who must I be to inherit eternal life? The disciples exchange glances with one another. Is this not the same question that burns within them? After hearing Jesus' rebuke, do not hinder the children, and Jesus' promise, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. You know the commandments, Jesus says to the man. Yes, the man replies, I've kept them since I was a child. Surely there must be something more he must do. That's the way of the world, after all. He must work to earn a wage so he can secure status and comfort and fulfill his duties to family and society. He knows this formula well, do something, receive something. What must I do to earn eternal life? But something doesn't feel quite right about that. It doesn't make sense in his soul for eternal life to be earned. If it could be earned, why did the children receive it, even though they'd done nothing? If it could be earned, he would have already earned it. He kept the commandments. He's earned plenty in his lifetime. But he knew that he hadn't yet earned peace for his soul. So maybe, maybe that was something that could be earned. Maybe that was something that could never be earned. Maybe it was more of a gift. The only gift this man understands is an inheritance. So he wonders if that's the question. Who must I be to receive this inheritance. And as he falls to his knees before Jesus, the question tumbles, twisted out of him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The man longs to know eternity is a certainty. He is quite capable, unlike the children. He knows what to do. He knows who to ask. He knows how to get to the right place. He is entirely self-sufficient, There is just one thing he lacks. And that one lacking is the source of all of his anxious striving. It's almost like he wasn't told when he was a little child that he was blessed just for being. He keeps trying to feel that the But that might be true even of his soul. He lives in such a way that everyone has no choice but to respect him, respect his accomplishments, his success, as well as his respectability. Jesus looks at him, loves 
him and says, you lack one thing. In order to gain what you lack, you must let go of all that you have. The man leaves crestfallen, carrying his wondering and anxiety with him. For several days, he stews in anger, then grief, until one morning he awakes to realize the feeling in his chest making it difficult to breathe is helplessness. This was new. Helpless was not something he was accustomed to. His whole life long, he'd been the helper, the neighbor others sought when they had need, the brother others depended on, the businessmen offering guidance and loans. Helpless was new. He sat with that feeling and heard children laughing and playing outside and remembered the children Jesus got in the dirt with. They had been carried to Jesus by adults and friends, then carried away. They could do very little for themselves. They depended on others for food, for shelter, for everything. They were helpless, and yet Jesus loved them so. Jesus blessed them. Jesus declared the kingdom of God was theirs. That was the blessing this man desired, and something like hope lodged alongside the helplessness in his heart. As the children laughed outside, he looked around his comfortable home, and his eyes landed on a pitcher that was used to wash guest feet. He had several. He realized he could do with one less. He picked one, and before he could think too much, rather impulsively, rather childlike, he carried the pitcher to the market, found a merchant, and sold it for quite a profit. The merchant commented on how nice the pitcher was and wondered why the man was selling it. The man's heart skipped a beat. Should he, could he tell the truth? How could he not? He had always been a truth teller. You shall not give false witness was one of the commandments Jesus listed that he said he had always kept. So he said to the merchant, I met the teacher, Jesus of Nazareth. Have you heard of him? The merchant nodded, his eyes widening with amazement, curiosity, wonder. You met him? Is he as holy as they say? Yes, I think so, the man said. He is unlike anyone I have ever met. His teaching is strange. He told me to do this, to sell the things I own and to give whatever I earn to the poor. I don't understand why this is what I must do, but I feel that I must. I must try and see if by doing it I can understand why. The merchant's eyes filled with tears. My friend, the amount I told you that the pitcher is worth, that is the exact amount my sister needs to pay off a debt. I wish I could give it to her myself, but I can't. She is recently widowed, a mother of three. Things are so hard for them. I have been helping all I can, but this is too much. The man interrupts. Take it. Please give it to her. And something like hope fills his heart as he walks away. The, man, the merchant shouted thank yous in his ears. The man hurries home, wondering what he might sell next. Each time he gave a little more of what he thought he was away, the anxiety he had about eternity, the worry he held about his soul, the questions he carried about what he had earned, what he was worth, the question he carried about who he was melted into peace. Again and again he had the chance to tell others how he had been taught to live. Selling, giving, releasing, pursuing peace, not just for himself, but for those around him who had longings and needs and questions of their own. The question remained with him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he learned to laugh at the shame he once felt that the question came out all mixed up. Was this a wondering about being or doing? Was this a longing for direction or assurance? Yes, both, all of it. Jesus knew that, and Jesus gave him a path. 
Jesus gave us a path that reveals that every question we have about eternal life is also a question about the presence of the kingdom of God. What must I do to inherit eternal life? I must be like the little children, unhindered, uninhibited, unashamed, carried by others, reaching out to Jesus. This is the wisdom children embody that we forget about as our hair grays and thins. We forget how to be carried. But to those who are carried belongs the kingdom of God. We lose our ability to reach unreservedly, but to those whose hands are dirty and desperate belong the kingdom of God. We are blessed here to have children who remind us who the kingdom of God belongs to, who remind us that this is a belonging that cannot be earned, an inheritance that can never be lost. But it is a reality that could be forgotten. And Jesus has given us a path of remembrance, the Lenten path of mercy and mortality, where we can shed more of the accumulated things and ideas that we think constitute who we are. We can give it all away, piece by piece, and in each giving, receive peace for our souls. Amen. Please rise as you feel able as we sing together hymn number 432, How Clear Is Our Vocation, Lord. Let's remain standing as we confess together what we believe, using the excerpt from A Brief Statement of Faith, which is printed in your bulletins.
In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. What is God calling us to let go of? How are we being called to live and give so that others know that they are cared for, accepted, and loved? Could we give a little more freely, not because we're trying to earn some kind of eternal status for our souls, but because we know our identity is free from anything that could be earned?
Eternal Creator, we give and seek to live so that others may know your sovereignty and grace. Use these gifts in our lives to tell the story of your mercy, provision, and reconciliation. Amen. Please rise so we can sing hymn number 509, All Who Hunger, Gather Gladly. You may be seated. However you come to this table today, childlike or having forgotten a bit of what that's like, certain or anxious or anywhere in between, this is the Lord's table and all are welcome. This is God's table and you are welcome. Will you join your hearts with me in prayer? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give our thanks and praise. Holy, holy, holy God, we meet you here as our host and guests and praise you for your presence, for your teaching, for the ways you show us steadfast love and the laughter of friends and the snow as well as the sunshine and the comfort of peace even in the midst of struggle and sorrow. We praise you for the reminder of all that is represented at this table and the reminder also that there is more than we can see or taste. Help us to meet you in the bread and the cup. Help us to more fully experience your love in this meal of gladness and grace, this meal of lament and lingering over a lamb that was slain, this meal that echoes prayers of the generations from the fleeing Israelites to the faltering friends of Christ, the ones he gathered with for his last taste of bread before the cross. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread and praised you, God of all creation. After giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and praised you, God of all creation, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. 
We remember your love for us. We taste here that we can remember your great love even in our worry. Even if we fear resting or can't find space for it, your love and grace still overwhelm. Christ living, dying, rising, praying, and reigning persists still, and the Holy Spirit hears and cares for us. May we believe and be nourished here and feel the urgency of the world's longing for a grace like this, a freedom like this, a love like this. Merciful God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine, that in eating and drinking together we may be made one with Christ and with one another. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for you. And the blood of Christ, shed just for you. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord and Savior. And Christ will come, and he will come again.
Please pray with me. Loving God, we come to this table hungry and we leave feeling full, full of hope and full of promise. During this week of our Lenten journey, we give a little piece of what we have back to you. We know that getting ready for this mystery of Easter is big work. During this season, help us to learn how to trust you, love you, and share your love with others. May we always seek you the way you seek after us. And together, let us say the words our Father taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing number 188, Jesus Loves Me. What must we do to earn an inheritance? Nothing at all. What must we do to believe all of this grace is really ours, that we can't earn it and we aren't supposed to try, we're just supposed to receive? We must receive the bread and offer grace to others. We must take the cup and offer the same mercy we've been given to everyone we meet. And now may God hear and respond whenever you may call. May Christ be made known to you in all things. May the Holy Spirit open our eyes and fill our hearts with love. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.